Hello, everyone. I'm Allison Tolman. As Helen mentioned, a member of the program committee serving with Amy Poster and Victoria Melendez. And I'm pleased today to introduce our speaker, Ramona Handel Bayema, who will be speaking about her new book, Art Across Borders, Japanese Artists in the United States Before World War II. Ramona has her PhD in modern Japanese history from Columbia, and she's currently teaching at Columbia a course on, to read this now, it's at the Committee on Global Thought, a course on art in protest, an, investi an investigation of how artists use their art as a form of opposition. And she's also teaching a class at NYU this semester too. I was especially excited to explore this topic that uh, Ramona is going to tell us about today because just yesterday I was at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco and saw this wonderful Obata Chiura piece that is Ramona's first image. So without any further ado, Ramona, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to JASA today. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm so um, excited to be here and I'm really honored that uh, JASA invited me to participate and share this, this book and some of what I found here. So thank you, Allison. Thank you, Victoria Melendez. Thank you, Amy Poster. Um, and if you'll allow me the indulgence, my mother, Jane Handel, is joining here today and I can't um, proceed with this project or discussing it without thanking her um, as my editor and guide and mentor. So thank you, mom, for, for supporting me in this project for all of the years that were invested in it. Um, so Art Across Borders, Japanese Artists in the United States Before World War II uh, was a book published last year based on my dissertation um, that was completed in 2011. Um, I wrote this book with in the hopes that it was not going to be kind of too academic, not too much jargon uh, for a general audience, those that were um, not necessarily specialists in Japanese history or art history, um, but that would be an opportunity to elevate the artists that I, I really focused on for this book uh, to resuscitate them because I think that they were extremely important in American art history, in Japanese art history, and this, this new most recent field of Asian American art history. And um, whereas hundreds of artists um, came to the United States from Japan and studied and worked here, I really focused on five that I will introduce to all of you today. Um, in, in a little bit of detail, and hopefully to entice you to want to learn more. And I'm hoping that this biographical information about these artists and their lives and the contexts in which they work will invite more scholarship on, on them. Um, I Some of the themes that I, I did touch on in the book um, that were carries over from my research project were really inspired by the idea of a national aesthetic. And uh, Professor Bert Winter Tamaki's work on Isamu Noguchi and Japanese national aesthetics really inspired much of this. And what do we think of as Japanese art? I think we have a pretty entrenched notion of it. So that the, the painting on the book is purposefully not what we associate necessarily with Japanese art, but it was done by Ishigaki Eitaro, this is 14th Street in New York, where he had an art studio at the time, and he was doing a snapshot of his environs. And as soon as we find out that it's an artist by the name of Ishigaki Eitaro, as soon as we look back at that painting, we kind of search for what we think of as Japanese art. Um, and I think these artists outside of Obata really, really complicate that idea of what, what it constitutes Japanese art. And related to that, how do we categorize them? Um, whether that's important or not is for another discussion, but it does, it does matter in terms of curatorial decisions. Um, are they in Asian art museums or in modern art museums? What collections they're in, what galleries would represent their work? 
Um, and I, I argue, um, unlike my, my colleagues, Shiku Wong, Tom Wolf, who have done phenomenal work and research about Yasuo Kuniyoshi and, and others um, who I will talk about today, that they're not really, in my definition, Asian American because the category was somewhat anachronistic for that time. Of course, legally, they couldn't be American um, until 1952, when then a couple of them did become US citizens, but they were by definition disenfranchised. Um, so the Asian American category would not be something that they would recognize in, of themselves. Um, and there are ramifications for that. And um, we'll get to it particularly when I speak about one of the artists who is not included generally in Asian um, American art history lexicon. We'll discuss why. And lastly, one of the things that really drew me to this topic was this kind of magic moment in the interwar period between World War I and World War II when politics was really and political ideology and political activism on the part of artists was of supreme importance and where one stood and what stand um, you made against fascism, particularly um, in your position against the Spanish Civil War of the 30s, um, really defined artists and made or, break their, made or broke their careers. So this was a very interesting um, moment, I think, in the American art world as um, American modernism starts differentiating itself from Europe. Um, so I started to frame this project in a couple ways because I saw how many people from Japan were coming to the United States and studying art and becoming artists. And I found that they were divided into two groups. I called the first wave and the second wave. And the first wave is pretty soon after Japan opens, quote unquote, to the West in the 1850s and many Japanese came to the United States to study and, and as well to Europe. Um, and this first wave of artists came as artists. They had trained in Japan and they arrived on American shores as fully fledged artists. So the real um, stamp in your passport that would help legitimize you in the Japanese art world was working and studying in Paris. That's the center of the art world. And those who could afford it, those who were coming from elite families immediately went from Japan to Paris. There is no point in stopping in the United States. But if you didn't have the financial means to be able to go and live and study immediately in Paris, many stopped in the United States to sell their work. Now, what's interesting for those of you who know about the, the divide between yoga or Western style painting that was being adopted at the time and Nihonga, Japanese style, these artists who have first came to the United States were yoga artists. They painted with oil on canvas, often very impressionistic, but there was no market for that in the United States. Americans did not want um, oil paintings of French haystacks by a Japanese artist. There was a Japan craze, uh, much of it influenced by Japanism and the popularity of Japanism. They wanted Japanese works. These guys who first arrived here in this first wave were able to adapt their techniques to the American market and would do impressionistic renderings of cherry blossoms, which were very, very popular. They were very savvy. Um, and these artists included Yamada Basuke, whose painting you see here. I think this was done in 1905. Many of you might know Yoshida Hiroshi, um, who goes back to Japan, gives up on yoga and becomes a woodblock artist doing Japanese style um, versions of the Grand Canyon and the Taj Mahal that were very popular in the 1930s. Um, Inukai Kyokai, and of course, Obata Chiuda, who I'm, I will be talking about today. Um, I made the bold decision in this book to include a photographer along with the other artists. And um, Toyo Miyatake is the artist that I landed on to focus on in the book. Um, 
But before I talk about him, I, I will explain a little bit about why I included photographers, which is an unusual perhaps decision. I think we're used to books about Japanese art that will have ceramics and lacquerware and screens and kimono. Um, and so multiple mediums are included in these surveys, but often you don't see photographers. Now, when photographers land in Japan um, to document Meiji era Tokugawa transitional Japan and visually before it kind of disappears, uh, they leave behind a camera uh, photography craze um, as cameras become more affordable to the middle classes. Uh, it's very early adopted as just um, a, 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 an art, an art form, sometimes a hobby and sometimes otherwise. And particularly pictorialism, which is an ism to describe a, a genre of photography where the camera and the printing process is just used almost like a paintbrush to create um, uh, softer, really manipulated images, not documentation photographs, not realistic. And so part of this first wave of artists that come, came included photographers. One of them who was one of the fathers of Japanese modernist photography, often featured in Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography and all over Japan is Nakayama Iwata. And it's very, um, there's very little known about the over a decade he spent in New York. He had a, a studio on Fifth Avenue and he was wildly um, successful here before he moves on to Paris and he's bumping, rubbing elbows with um, Man Ray. And then he goes back um, and becomes kind of a, a titan of Japanese modernist photography in the 20th century. He got started here after he received a scholarship from the Tokyo University of Art um, where he was the first uh, scholar to get a grant for photography. And interestingly enough, Fukuhara Shinzo was also in New York before he moves on to Paris. You might know him as the founder of Shiseido Cosmetics. He was here at Columbia University doing a degree in pharmacology. Um, and I would bet any money I have that he was regularly frequenting the 291 gallery of Alfred Stieglitz and informing his photography. Um, so photographers were certainly part of this first wave. So Obata Chiuda, um, as a member of this first wave arrives and um, he grew up in Northeastern Japan. His adopted father who was actually an older brother was also an artist, very renowned um, in, in those circles and who provided him with the training, set him up with teachers and he worked with masters in Tokyo doing all Japanese style Nihonga works and Tosa school works for those of you who know that genre. Um, he worked in shrines doing screens. He won awards. He was very successful and he makes this very odd decision um, despite being young and, and well um, critiqued and acclaimed to move to the United States. And he just wants to try his luck. He's young, he's adventuresome, and he wants to see what it's like. He goes with full intention of returning to Japan someday. Um, <clears throat> this photograph pardon me, is taken at um, San Francisco's Palace Legion of Honor, actually, in the early 30s when he returned from a visit to Japan. And you will see a painting behind him that we're about to see in, in reproduction that is now part of the De Young collection. And this was a father-son show. He had returned to Japan um, to see his father, who was ailing, um, but unfortunately died before he he got there and he brought back some of his works to display, to display with his own. Um, he, he was a rough and tumble guy. Um, he had a very difficult time arriving in San Francisco in 1903. Pardon me, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Um, Anti-Asian sentiment was at a fever pitch. He experiences the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, does sketches of it. Um, it was a brutal period of time to be Asian. In fact, I found out 
um, little uh, Japantown was used to be next door to Chinatown. And then after the earthquake, the Japanese community moved to the Western edition, if you're familiar with San Francisco, to distance themselves from the Chinese. Anyways, Obata was very dedicated to kind of mixing groups. And he's in this Japantown ethnic enclave. It's really gonna define um, these communities in California, very much unlike New York, where there isn't a Japanese ethnic enclave. There is one in San Francisco. He always wants to break out of it. These artists always wanted to see if they could break out of these kind of locked in groups. And he formed an e the East West Art Society in 1921. There were Russians, there were Chinese, of course, Japanese and other American artists. It wasn't long lived, but they put together some pretty remarkable exhibitions in San Francisco. In 19, he starts hiking um, with friends and fellow artists in the Sierras. And this is where his real seminal works are gonna come um, to view. He starts applying these Japanese Nihonga techniques to the Western landscape with pretty spectacular results. Um, and in the high Sierras. In 1929, he goes back with his family to Japan and he turns this series of paintings and sketches into a woodblock series. And um, like I was just chatting with Allison about who got to see these just yesterday, they're exquisitely beautiful and he was quite a perfectionist with them. Um, and when he does eventually return to California, they were very, very um, successful and exhibited widely up and down the coast. The mix of East and West, modern and tradition, abstract and um, conventional styles really appealed to uh, Pacific coast tastes at that time. As a result, he gets a position as an art instructor at UC Berkeley, where he was beloved. But he really maintains a life in Japantown. He never likes it to um, speak English very much. He likes to drink sake, and he really liked wearing formal <laughs> Japanese clothes. So he was really at this intersection. Um, I don't know if he ever really stopped being Japanese, um, if, if you can say that. In 1953, he is allowed to become a US citizen, um, but he rarely spoke English, according to his family members. This is the a landscape of one of the High Sierra paintings that you saw in the photo behind him at the Palace Legion of Honor. He's known for Obata Blue, um, and which is when you see his works in real life, you understand what that means. His wife, who was a renowned Ikebana um, artist who did accompanying works for his exhibitions, was the one who mixed his pigments. And even if he wanted to paint at four in the morning, apparently, she would have to wake up and paint with and mix paints for him at four in the morning. And she hated the fact that um, everybody called it Oblada Blue when she was the one mixing the pigments. Um, Given that he was on the California coast, he was of course interned um, with executive order 9066 with other Japanese nationals and Japanese and US citizens, um, ethnic Japanese, along with his wife and family. Initially he's held at Tanferan, south of San Francisco, a, a racetrack. They were held in um, horse stalls. And um, he becomes really nervous about the children at the camp. Um, who are just traumatized and wandering around with nothing to do. And he started immediately with an art school. And people from around the country who knew his work, who were his former students, donate materials to, to this school. And when he is transferred to the Topaz um, internment camp, he continues with the school and it becomes the Topaz Art School. And this photo that you're seeing here is taken at, at Topaz. And they not only taught children, but they taught adults with design skills, drafting skills, graphic design skills, um, so that they could, when they were eventually let out of the camps, hopefully they would be able to have skills that were marketable. Um, he's released. Um, there's a lot more detail about that experience. He created a, um, a illustrated diary of his life at Topaz. Um, some of his landscapes of the surrounding environs are, are gorgeous. Um, in, in the book, I, I go into a lot more detail, but he, he spends the rest of his life after World War II 
teaching at Berkeley, but also conducting tours to Japan, culture tours to gardens and temples for Americans because he firmly believed that the um, conflict of World War II was as a result of not understanding each other's art, aesthetics, and culture. So on to the second wave. We did the first wave, those artists who arrived as artists and were trying to make some money. Um, the second wave were very, very different. They were Japanese who arrived as laborers, agricultural workers, anything to just make money, learn some English and return to Japan. Now, if they got married and if they established families, they were more likely to become permanent um, members and didn't leave, and they became what we know today as Issei, the first generation of Japanese American. Um, but the people in my research project, it's remarkable to what extent they never thought they were going to stay here forever. There is always a plan and always an intention to return, and how and when to do that. And um, at, at least with the artists, maybe that made for a more um, transitory life or temporary life. I mean, farmers, I imagine, would be more invested in the land, but these guys really thought they were going to go back. They had no experience with art prior to arrival. They had no intention of becoming artists. They didn't know anything about Japanese art. Anything they learned about Japanese art, they learned at the hands of Americans. Americans would show them ukiyo-e, et cetera, and teach them about Japanese art and say, this is something you should be into. Um, but And by the way, this painting is really fabulous. It's not by one of the artists featured in the book, but by one of them named Usui Bunpei. And it's a party on a New York rooftop of his Japanese artist friends that just were enjoying the New York 1920s jazz age. So among these, um, I selected a few figures, Kuniyoshi Yasuo, who's the most famous, and forgive me for going back and forth, sometimes I use the conventional Japanese way of last name first, family name first, and adopted name, given name last. Um, Kuniyoshi Yasuo, Ishigaki Eitaro, and Shimizu Toshi are, are really emblematic of the second wave in New York. This photo, they all knew each other. It was a small group. They were very um, supportive of each other's work and careers. They were also critical of each other's works and career and probably a bit competitive. That's Shimizu on the left, Kuniyoshi in the center. And the art critic, um, maybe some of you know, Arishima Ikuma on the right. This is when Kuniyoshi went back to Japan in 1931 to explore his options there and see what, see what was gonna happen um, for him. I'll talk about that a little bit, but um, Shimizu was already back in, in Japan and, and was trying to welcome Kuniyoshi into the Japanese art world, the Gadan, which had become, was established at that point. So Kuniyoshi, um, most of you probably have heard of him. Um, it's wild today because when, during his lifetime in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s in New York, he was, an art world darling. He was a star. He was um, friends with Edward Hopper and a bigger name than Edward Hopper before Edward Hopper was Edward Hopper. And he, he was at, at, at the front of the pack. Um, he was the first living artist, not Japanese, first living artist to have a solo show at the Whitney in 1951, I think. Um, he was born in Okayama, came here to make his fortune, <laughs> and landed in Seattle, hated it, hated the weather, couldn't understand the language, was miserable, moves to Los Angeles because the weather was going to be better, works in hotels, works in the Imperial Valley as a fruit picker, um, thinks for a minute that he wants to be an airline pilot. It's not long after Kitty Hawk and a lot of planes are going down. He decides it's a little dangerous. Still struggling with English. Um, he discovered art classes at night school. And all of these artists do this. And I think it's because art school is a place where they feel welcome. Um, there's this kind of expectation that Japanese are innately artistic. <laughs> so they are welcomed in art classes. They don't have to know English, um, but they can feel connected. And there were other Japanese art students. And some magic moment, which is um, a, um, 
forgive the sirens in the back for my New York <laughs> apartment. Um, they, he decides to be a capital A artist and to do that, he moves to New York. The timing was perfect. He arrives, I think in 1907, 08. Um, he works, he struggles, he goes to some kind of academic schools in the beginning. They're boring to him, he's already done that. And then the Armory Show hits, 1913. And the whole world is just turned upside down for young artists in New York. And everybody wants to be a cubist, everybody wants to be the next Saison. Kuniyoshi wasn't at the Armory, he heard about it though, and in his classes from his fellow, from fellow students and he gets excited. Um, he goes to Art Students League, which I'll talk to about in a moment, but he just has a blast in New York. And um, part of it is thanks to his wife, Catherine Schmidt, um, who is seen um, on his lap <laughs> in this photo at a Penguin Club gathering. She's at the Art Students League as well. She's also an artist and she kind of brings him out of his shell and they just have fun together being the art stars of New York. His teacher at the Art Students League was interesting though. It was Kenneth Hayes Miller, who was a pretty conservative painter in his own right, but he was very popular among young artists at the time because he knew how to nurture their individuality and their voice. He didn't try to make them all the next Cezanne. He tried to figure out who the next X was. Um, and members of Kenneth Hayes Miller's class started going up to Ogon Court, Maine, um, thanks to a patron and had a summer art colony. And that's where Kuniyoshi comes to his own. You know, prior he was doing these kind of Christian, heavy, allegorical, durer influenced um, works that were just not getting over very well. But he discovers American folk art. So whereas we know in Paris, they're looking at art from West Africa and art brut and um, all of these different influences that are gonna influence modernism, American modernists are looking at American folk art. So we see Kuniyoshi captures in this um, very unique way that's very particular to him, the countryside of New England. Um, cows, as you can see here, become a symbol for him. He becomes obsessed about cows. Critics like Henry McBride at the time are saying, you know, what's up with the cows? And he says, you know, I was born in the year of the cow. Maybe that's it. I don't know. And I just think they're ridiculous looking. So that he becomes associated with cows. And while but his colleagues and cohort are in New York and doing you know, the new pace of the jazz age and city streets and real people downtown and trying to capture that, the pace of this new modernity in their images, Kuniyoshi is doing the opposite. It's like the, the, the full dialectic, right? He's in the countryside doing farmers and cows and roosters and for the Daniel Gallery crowd, it's kind of exotic because it's so different what he is looking at and what he's obsessed by. Um, he, to make money, he also took photographs of his fellow artist friends' works. And um, I love this photograph, it's at the Met. Um, it's on display at the Met, if you go over there. He's capturing, um, uh, this landscape in black and white, which is going to be the ultimate portrait as a self portrait of himself in the act of this creation. It's a pretty brilliant little painting. He also did um, fine art photography. Um, Tom Wolfe, who has heroically championed Kuniyoshi's career and done the most scholarship on, on him of anybody. Um, and I'm, we're all should be grateful for him for making sure that Kuniyoshi stays at the front of our minds did a great book and study on um, Kuniyoshi's photography um, that I, I recommend. Now, in the 30s, he becomes close friends with the artist Jules Pasquin, um, who's Romanian, but Parisian born, who takes him into a completely different direction. And he starts doing these portraits and still lifes in these um, very uh, washed out brush strokes, the, that kind of, um, folk art quality is no longer present. And it's always these women and um, 
reading newspapers, smoking cigarettes, looking bored. And um, it became a re another running joke in the same way that the cows were a running joke. New York makes jokes around um, Kuniyoshi's women and models would show up at his exhibitions in like t-shirts and, and lingerie, smoking cigarettes and reading newspapers to poke fun at him. He was that famous that he was kind of a New Yorker featured um, joke for people. And um, as the depression wears on and as World War II heats up, the women get more <laughs> and more depressed, um, to, which makes many of us think that they were really self-portraits of Kuniyoshi's inner life. I think he um, really dealt with depression. Moving on, um, his post-war World War II works are very kind of almost psychedelic. The, obviously the color palette has dramatically changed. Um, he really tried to stay up with the times. He continued to be a teacher at Art Students League, a beloved teacher. He didn't get into abstract expressionism. He was never gonna become um, an abstract artist, but he started exploring with these very loud um, colors and clowns, sad clowns, no longer sad women, but sad clowns become a running theme for him. Um, just briefly, he, he did return to Japan in 1931, as I, as I noted, um, and uh, to see if he could establish himself there, given that the art market was so depressed in the US, uh, but didn't stay long. He, he arrived right after the Japanese Manchurian incident in September of that year, and he just felt deeply uncomfortable with uh, uh, Japan's militarism, inspiring him to actually work in the Office of War Information, doing propaganda and radio notices to Japanese nationals, encouraging them to, to break free. Um, again, Shipu Wong writes a lot about this, so very interesting. Um, again, uh, successful, he unfortunately dies of cancer in 1953. Um, but given his prominence, the Smithsonian Archive has a lot of work on him. His lithographs, which he did during the Depression to make money, are often come up at auction. But most of his major works are in museums, and, and the vast majority are back in Japan. Um, there was a big bubble era spending spree for these artists, and they are largely in Japanese museums. However, there is enormous comprehensive retrospective, unfortunately, that didn't travel. That was at the Smithsonian um, in 2015. Next, um, that I'd like to introduce you to, because I think that um, most of you are probably unfamiliar with him, even though he too was very influential, was Ishigaki Eitaro, another one who came from Wakayama as a laborer. And um, he landed in Bakersfield and, um, an interesting kind of Japan-US historical note had to leave Bakersfield and um, landed in San Francisco where he becomes um, friends and lovers of Gertrude Boyle who was a very renowned sculptor at the time in San Francisco. She was already married to a Japanese man, um, Isen Kano, who was a poet. Um, and she kind of takes the much younger Ishigaki under her wing and really influences him and brings him to the poet Joaquin Miller's Bohemian Enclave in the Oakland Hills, where Ishigaki is going to meet Isamu Noguchi's father, Yonejiro, um, and really turns Ishigaki onto art and poetry and also leftism and Bohemian culture. The scandal that erupts from their affair um, forces them to leave in 1915. She was well known enough that it made the newspapers that she was in this kind of Japanese love triangle. They flee to New York in 1915 where they feel like they can live more freely. They land in Harlem. Um, and where, what happens, of course, like all of the others, Ishigaki goes to Art Students League, which is just this organization that fostered this new artist. Um, he works with John Sloan, who's also a leftist, who was an illustrator for the New Masses and the Masses. And so what emerges is Ishigaki's art and his political um, life really intersect in New York. And he befriends 
leftists from all over the world, including doing translations of Marx into Japanese um, for Katayama Sen, who was a political activist and one of the founders of the Japanese Communist Party. So Ishigaki is in New York running around with, th with this group doing um, always allegorical works about oppression, um, never of Asian Americans though. He features African Americans quite a lot, um, but you don't see the plight of the Asian American experience in his work. Um, here is a painting, another whipping on horseback painting, but this is in a Cuba revolution. You don't see the Asian American experience. He marries the journalist Ayako Ishigaki, really well-educated, also in New York at the time. Um, they become just a real power duo in New York. Um, they are the mentors and kind of godparents of Isama Noguchi, who crashes on their couch. Um, they're friends with the dancer Ito Michio, who is in town from, from London, having worked with Ezra Pound. They are really the intersection of Japan expats, leftist activists, and obviously a shift in style around social realism as Ishigaki becomes a really good friend of Diego Rivera's, who also is in town in New York working on the Rockefeller Center. So we see a, a major stylistic change um, shift in Ishigaki's influence, um, obviously from Mexican muralists. Um, I'll close with the Ishigaki story by saying, um, I'll close the Ishigaki story by saying, you know, during World War II, he and Kuniyoshi were in New York, so they were not interned, um, surveyed, but not interned. Ishigaki's problems in the United States really heat up after World War II. That's when the problem started. He was targeted um, under the Red Scare and um, the McCarthy era for his leftist um, activities. And he's forced to leave the United States where he's been um, a resident for decades. He and Ayaka are forced back to, to Tokyo. And unfortunately, he never, he never paints again. His art is over and um, he dies rather young in Tokyo. This is another example of the social realist vein that his works um, heavily went into in the 1930s. Shimizu Toshi is the least well-known of the group here. Um, he wanted to join the military, failed, so he moved to the United States. Um, he went to art classes like the others at night, working with a Dutch artist, an academic artist. Um, he fell in love with art, but Seattle was kind of a small pond and he was a big fish, so he moves to New York. He too is going to join the Art Students League where he becomes friends with Ishigaki and Kuniyoshi. He's friends with the photographer Nakayama Iwata, who I mentioned earlier. He always intends to go back to Japan and enter the art world. Um, he, he, you know, for those artists who married American women, they stay here and they become more integrated in American society. Shimizu goes back to Japan at one point to marry a, a Japanese wife here, um, and that's their son Ikuo and his brother Kiyoshi, who also becomes an artist in New York. Um, he wants to become a player in the Japanese art world. That's always his intention, even though he lives here for decades himself. Um, he does go to Paris, is prolific there. He does great street scenes in New York, um, Paris and Spain. I, I like to think of them as little postcards of these cosmopolitan centers that he was living in. Um, he's kind of what I call an example of the limits of cosmopolitanism. You would expect um, that, um, sorry, I was just, um, oops. Uh, you would expect that, you know, after this experience living in all of these different places, that um, he would feel more inclined to um, a, a, an international point of view rather than a nationalist one. But um, he falls more in line with his friend, Leonard Fujita, or Tsukuharu Fujita, who some of you might know, who was very popular in Paris. 
And during World War II, they're hired by the Japanese Imperial Army um, as illustrators and they um, illustrate the war, they illustrate in very idealized terms to say the least, um, the imperial expansion of Japan uh, in North, in Mongolia, in South Pacific Islands, and of course in China, <clears throat> pardon me. And um, again, Bert Winter Tamaki has a great essay about Sensoga um, that's available, um, but Shimizu becomes wholeheartedly involved in that. And tangentially, his works of, of Japan become idealized renderings of the countryside. He's not so interested in the urban anymore and diverse settings. He's interested in, in an idealized countryside of farmers and where everything is in harmony and the so-called authentic Japan before it became westernized could be found um, very consistent with other fascist regimes in their art at the time that were really glorifying the farmer and the agricultural and the kind of personification of blood and, and soil. Um, there's no famine here and there's no hardship. It's just uh, happy farmers. That's where he turned his attention. And lastly, um, he gets a little bit more abstract with his renderings of the Asia population, Asian population. Um, so, you know, from Brunei and elsewhere, they, they have almost a batik quality. At the same time, he's an employee of the Imperial uh, Army. And during the last years of the war, of course, they want to show a robust, capable, strong army. Obviously, photographers aren't going to be able to show that because the army was not robust um, at this point, much less well fed. So painters realistic renditions of, of an idealized military force became increasingly important to the army. Um, Shimizu is gonna die in 1945, my guess is by, by suicide. I haven't been able to confirm that, but he was heartbroken at the loss of the war and the loss of his son who died in the war. Lastly, um, this is the photographer that I, I included, Miyatake Toyo who landed in Little Tokyo, another now ethnic enclave rather than the more um, cosmopolitan districts that New York um, offered for Japanese. Um, he studied with the photographer Edward Weston when um, Edward Weston was living in LA. Um, he also organized an exhibition of Edward Weston's works, um, which allowed Weston to have money to be able to travel to Mexico with Tina Madani. And Weston in his diaries always credits this exhibition. His, you know, grocers were buying Weston prints and helped him um, have the funds. Um, so Miyatake was very hands-on in supporting his mentor. This photo is showing him with the dancer Ito Michio, who I referred to earlier, who was now in Los Angeles um, performing at the Hollywood Bowl. And they became close collaborators in, in art projects. Miyatake before the war, his, his Manzanar photos, which I will address in a second, are very well known. In the interwar period, he was doing very avant-garde and abstract works. He was renowned in international photography circles um, and won multiple awards for those. He was interested in light and shadow and structure. And very rarely um, people were in them. And he had a photo studio on First Street in Little Tokyo um, where he made his money by day. And at night he turned um, to very experimental works including this one. And of course, portraits of dancers like Ito Michio which is this very, very beautiful portrait of him. Um, Miyatake is going to be interned at Manzanar. Um, he snuck in a lens to the camp and um, Japanese nationals were not allowed to have cameras, um, including Kuniyoshi's camera was confiscated in New York, so he couldn't photograph anymore. Um, for security reasons, Japanese were not allowed to have cameras, and but Miyatake snuck in a lens and was able to make this kind of 
um, crazy camera that you can see on display at Manzanar today um, out of kind of uh, just spare parts and, and wood. And the story goes that Edward Weston, knowing that his friend was interned and knowing the importance of photography to him, was able to get permission from the camp director for Miyatake to have special permission to take photographs. And so we have an incredible series of photographs that Miyatake took of the Manzanar experience. Um, he, you know, Ansel Adams and Dorothy Lang, Lang um, also went to Manzanar to take photos. And um, there's interesting work comparing their points of view. Ansel Adams was very fixated on um, demonstrating how American these um, the internees were and that it was a crime. And Dorothea Lang was really focused on showing the misery of the experience. Miyatake was interested in showing everything, the daily life, the daily lived experience of, of Manzanar. And that included Japan. Um, like this um, funeral service that we are seeing here, that monument is still at Man Manzadar that you can see. And he showed the fish market with um, Japanese signs. He showed men cutting bonsai. He was not afraid to show the Japanese influence of, of the people that were interned. He didn't have an agenda to erase that. Um, but he also showed how American the, the second generation kids were as cheerleaders and having picnics. Um, it was a full view. And this is the work that he's really known for. However, I argue that his work in between the wars was, was just as significant and influential, um, but, but not given enough attention. Um, this is a closing image by Miyatake at the last day of Manzanar. I, I will just say in conclusion, I, I, I fear I've gone a little bit long, um, that the post-war legacy of, of these artists really um, determine where their works are. Um, and, you know, Obad is a, a California Legion of Honor, De Young Museum, Darling, his, his uh, children and grandchildren have been real wards of his estate. Um, but most of these works are really recognized in, in Japan where there are numerous books about these artists, um, far more than they are here. They're very much recognized and claimed in Japan is what I found much to my surprise. So um, I'm hoping that this book on the stories, you know, that I, I didn't get to share with you today, Obata started the first Japanese American baseball team. <laughs> And that's also what he's known for as being a big baseball fan, the Fujis. Um, there are a lot of really wonderful pieces that kind of give a full picture of an artist's life and how, how they sold themselves and sold their art and sold their story and were resilient and shape-shifted with the times, depending on where that art market was, dictated a lot of their art and their identity um, and their value in the market. So um, I really hope that um, some of you might pick it up. And I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramona. I, having read the book, I found it incredibly interesting because there were stories about artists whom I, I didn't know anything about. And we have a couple of questions that were submitted in advance, which, you know, we. JASA is a collector's organization. So people are always interested. Are the, is, even today, are these artists' works sold at auctions or are galleries representing their works? Um, thank you for that. Yes, the paintings are largely in museums. I don't see them come up very often. Um, however, I think as I noted, there was a big push during um, the depression to have kind of cheap and easy works. And so a lot of them started doing lithographs and Kuniyoshi lithographs I see come up pretty regularly. And he was very prolific. Um, so I see little small paintings of his come up pretty regularly. And I would say they're, they're affordable. They're not um, over, the, over the moon. You see little brush paintings come up on occasion by Obata. The Yosemite series is expensive. Mm -hmm. Whenever I see those come up, they're pricey, but they don't, they, they do come up. 
um, the de Young has the biggest collection of Obata and they're not going to get rid of those. But the paintings are in museums, but yes, the, the, the works on paper are available. Well, we had, a, we had a question from someone who was asking what the challenges you faced writing this book the re, about the research and um, who could um, speak to it. That's a, that's a really tricky question, interesting question. Um, of course, I, I really always, as a historian of Japan, I use Japanese sources um, as much as I can and um, particularly tried to emphasize their trips back to Japan. What were they looking for? What did Japan represent to them when, um, and how did the Japanese art world receive them when they went back? So I used a lot of those old sources. A really funny thing was that um, the Los Angeles Japanese newspapers, you know, these guys all came in during the Meiji era. And so their, the language kind of froze. So I found myself having to go and review my Meiji era Japanese language to be able to read the, the newspapers, which was very odd um, and, and challenging. I would say on a meta level, because I'm a historian of Japan, um, the way academia is currently set up is the Asian American studies and Asian studies are very separate. And I have been really trying to get them to, to interact and inform each other. Um, but in terms of grants and presentations and job opportunities, when you do a project like this that intersect disciplines, that, that was very challenging. A um, few specific questions. Um, first of all, a comment by Pat Graham, who wanted, um, who really enjoyed the presentation and um, wanted to let people know, I'm sure you know this, Ramona, but that the St. Louis Art Museum was gifted by Obata San Kyo, um, probably Obata's most famous painting, The Setting Sun of Sacramento Valley, which you began your presentation with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of his paintings are not on the open market, she says, and most are gifted to, to museums. Um, we, have a, we have a question. You, you talked about the first wave and the second wave. Was there a third or fourth wave? Ah, that's very interesting. Um, yes, um, I think... For example, Saburo Hasegawa, Hasegawa Saburo, the post-war um, uh, Japanese artists who came in um, on the abstract expressionist wave, certainly there was a big um, um, movement there, uh, but they came looking to become artists, right? Um, they were already artists in Japan and they wanted the New York experience. So after World War II, the center of the art world moves from Paris to New York, right? And so rather than all of these, you know, masses of Japanese going to Paris to get their art passport stamped, they start coming to New York instead. So you see um, groups in, in um, forming in, in Brooklyn and to this day, there's a huge Japanese community of artists living in New York. So yeah, third and fourth waves for sure. Um, in, the, in the last painting that you showed by Ishigaki, there, the person's asking, it seems to have been a representation of an Indian soldier with that characteristic Gurkha cap. Do you know what the story behind that is? Um, I do. He became, um, oops, can you still see me? <laughs> um, Ishigaki was really angry at Japanese imperial expansion into Asia. And he actually did um, with Kuniyoshi um, huge fundraisers to support Chinese civilians at the hands of the Japanese Imperial Army. And he included in that um, all of the colonized peoples, not just the Japanese, but um, he was very anti-colonization uh, of Asia. So like many social realists at the time, they tried to create the utopian version of the people, the oppressed peoples of the world uniting. So he would include Chinese, Indian, et cetera, as kind of overcoming the oppression of colonization. Um, we have another thank you for a wonderful presentation with a question, what does your research in the formation of diasporic identity mm -hmm 
imply for migration in this era of growing nationalist and populist sentiment? That's a mic drop question. Um, Ramona, while you're thinking of the answer, I'd like to just expand the question a little bit. And also, sure. I was I curious to find out how, where did these artists see themselves? I mean, did they position themselves as Asian artists in America? Did they position themselves as American artists when they went back to Japan? I think the easiest answer is to, to explain this. So Ishigaki did um, in the 20s an interview with a New York newspaper where he served tea, he flanked himself with cherry blossoms and he wore kimono. This man never wore kimono. He never, I mean, he grew up in Bakersfield and he knew exactly what he was doing because he was selling himself his Japanese-ness as part of, to add to the art value. So one day he would present himself as Japanese. Another day he would present himself as communist man and citizen of the planet. Um, so these artists had a lot of say in how they presented. Shimizu um, entered one of his paintings in an American art um, contest. He won first prize. When the judges found out that he was a Japanese national, they rescinded the prize. It was literally front page news. John Sloan wrote an article on uh, a letter on his behalf saying, don't do this. Um, it was a big, big kerfuffle, you know, cancel culture kerfuffle. And as a result of that, the Japanese in New York, Kuniyoshi Ichigaki, all of them got together and said, oh, you're gonna put us into an enclave. Well, we're gonna form our own Japanese artist group. And they established Gachokai, which was a painting Japanese name. They didn't call themselves Japanese American. They were like, we are a Japanese art society of New York. If you're going to say that we're not American. Now, a couple of years later in 1929, MoMA is now open. They're doing their second art exhibition, which is called 19 Living Americans. They include Kuniyoshi. There is a kerfuffle about that. How could you include Kuniyoshi in a 19 Americans exhibition? Um, so sometimes Kuniyoshi was arguing his Americanness. Sometimes he was arguing their Japanese-ness. Um, and so what I found was it's not a passive adoption of a category. They had a lot of say in how they wanted to be presented. Um, based we have on time for just two more questions because I hope that answered that's your question. how JASA is. Um, one, one question very quickly is about the, what, what do you know about the blue pigment? You were mentioning that Obata's um, wife mixed it. Um, I don't have specifics on, on, on that material. Just the, um, I don't, I wish I knew the mineral, um, but it was, they, I do know, I do know this, Obata had every one of his materials imported from Japan. Right. And I, I believe because I've studied a little bit about Nihonga, it's probably Malachite. Mm -hmm. Final question. Uh, were women coming in these first waves to the U.S. to study? Is that the topic of another book? So it's a really, um, I'm so glad that this, thank you for this question. I'm always shocked that I'm never asked this <laughs> because it's five chapters about men. I think because I'm looking so early at migration, it's mainly men that are coming right? Um, and because they're going to come and make money and then go back. That really was not open to women. And also legally, women were not allowed to come, right? The door is shut to them. Exactly. Well, Ramona, want. thank you so and much. And we will be happy to share Ramona's email with anybody who has further questions, because obviously a lot of people have a lot of things to think about. So thank you. thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. And I urge you to attend our next program, which will be both in person and by Zoom webinar um, on March 19th. Highlights from the Philadelphia Museum of Art with uh, Dr. Felice Fisher and Dr. Xiao Jin Wu talking about some highlights for from the Philadelphia collection and some items on their wish list. We look forward to seeing you either on screen or in person. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you.